Well, good morning and good afternoon, my friends, whichever time you're watching this. Uh, this session is going to be on step two of following Jesus. We're going to be talking about misery, and we're going to talk about introducing you to the quality of Jesus called uh, compatible, and then we're going to talk about the character trait of joy. So uh, let's get started here, and let's uh, look at a slide on the screen. It's uh, actually step two. Learn why God is compatible to transform our misery into joy. And as you can tell, uh, there's a, a really nice uh, sketch drawing up a pair. And if you noticed, uh, the thumbnail of this uh, session started out with uh, a pear tree. I believe that uh, the fruits of the Spirit need to be addressed as, as fruit because they grow on a tree. So that's, what, that's what, why I, I do that, and that's why I lead it with uh, fruit. So what I want to do, my friends, is I want to introduce you to what uh, misery is first, because I believe if we can identify the things that make us miserable in our life, we can then change those things around and make those things healthy. So uh, as you can see on the slide here, it says transforming misery into joy. To understand uh, how to uh, transform misery into joy, we first must look at what misery truly is. So what is the opposite nature of joy? Well, it's distress, sorrow, sadness, despair, and regret, and these will lead us to becoming miserable on the inside. Distress cuts us off from relationships, learning life, and enjoying life's experiences, and experiencing God. Okay? Despair limits us like a ball and chain from growth and the enjoyment of life because we become consumed with our circumstances. Regret is when we have lost control of our attitude and response. Not adding joy in our lives leads to depression that cuts off, us off from seeing hope and purpose in what life and eternity are all about. So my friends, I want to ask you the question, uh, how do you know you're miserable? Okay. I believe that it's important for us to identify this if we're going to bear joy against it, okay? So uh, would you say some people or most people are miserable, okay? It's hard to tell these days with all the fake drama everyone sees in the, seems to be indulging in, one has a difficult time telling whether people hate their lives as much as they say they do. Miserable people do exist, but I would like to believe that there aren't as many miserable people out there as there seems to be. With everyone complaining all over social media all the time, one could only conclude that everyone in the whole world hates their lives, but that can't be true. There are a few signs that are dead giveaways, however, here are eight of them. And uh, as I uh, get ready to put another slide on the screen, my friends, I, I believe that we need to sign signify what makes us miserable. I think that's part of our spiritual health. And I think uh, if we can identify with what's not working, we can change it to something that does work. So let's look at eight uh, signs that we may be a miserable person or we may be involved with a miserable relationship in our life. Let's check it out. And as you can see on the slide right now, number one, they managed to find the worst in everything, always finding the downside. A miserable person is miserable because the way he or she views the world is miserable. Their thought processes have been molded to always see the worst of every situation, the worst of every person, the worst of every possible future scenario. They manage to find the bad in any good you throw their way. Miserable people will point out the bad in any situation. Right? Do you know anybody like that? Number two, they hate their friends. Misery loves company, but a company of miserable people doesn't necessarily like one another very much. Miserable individuals seem to make friends with other miser miserable individuals. Miserable people like to make sure you know they're miserable. For this reason, it seems that only miserable people can put up with other miserable people. How miserable is that, my friends? Let's look at uh, point number three here. They uh, spend as much time as possible distracting themselves from reality. Well, what does that mean? They believe their lives are terrible, and because they believe their lives are terrible, they do their best to distract themselves from it, and often, and for as long as possible. Okay, let me read that again. 
They do their best to distract themselves from it as often and as for long as possible. They drink, do drugs, indulge in other indulging indulgences like reading, watching movies, and watching TV for hours on end. Pick a distraction. The problem is they are trying to get away from something they can't get away from. Reality isn't a choice. It's a state of existence. You exist and function within reality whether you like it or not. Trying to get away from it will only make you more miserable. And my friends, as that slide leaves the screen, we got to really, really talk about what uh, makes us miserable, okay? You can't change a miserable situation, but you can bear joy against it. Let's uh, look at the next slide and let's look at point number four here. The only thing they do every morning is get mad about having to get up. We all have these days. We all have those days we don't want to get out of bed. The miserable person, on the other hand, that wakes up every day with that thought process. When you don't like your life, you aren't especially thrilled to wake up and live it. The problem is starting your day dreads, dreading the following hours only makes things worse. Going from a miserable person to a happy one must start in the moment you wake up. S start happy and staying happy will be easy. And now let's look at point number five on our, on our list here. They give attitude to whomever, whomever, whenever the opportunity arises. Miserable people don't really like people. They don't like themselves very much. So you can't expect them to like anyone else either. For this reason, they like to give attitude to those they meet. This is something that, will, that we see clearly in a bigger city. Miserable people will do their best to overreact or reach inappropriately. Let me read that again. This is something you will see clearly in a big city. Miserable people will do their best to overreact or react inappropriately wherever they feel someone is annoying them. They could be something at, it could, this could be something as little as being cut off in traffic. They seem to have a switch that flips every time they get annoyed, which happens to be very often. Miserable people have an issue with being rude. And let's look at number six here. They like to point out other flaws in others. They like to point out flaws in others. Let me take a little drink here. <clears throat> Number six, they like to point out flaws in others. Miserable people like to bring out, bring others down to their level, usually by pointing out anything they feel wrong or unappealing about a person. They will briskly point out your insecurities and pretend like they don't know that what they are doing. But they do know what they are doing. They want wanted to see your reaction to see if your mood could be worsened to be up to par with theirs. Miserable people like to make themselves believe the world really is as ugly as they see it. So they they go pointing out the flaws and wanting to waiting for someone to agree with them, reaffirming their beliefs that what they are looking at really is as ugly and awful as they believe it to be. People, I, I, I know people like that in my personal life. I deal with that uh, in my family, and, and sometimes it's hard to uh, counteract that with joy. I know what that's like. I know what that's like. Let's look at the next slide, and let's look at point number seven here. Number seven, they don't like themselves very much, but still think they're better than the rest of the world. Miserable people are miserable, first and foremost because they don't like themselves very much. It may not even be all of them. It could just be one aspect of them that they find flawed that is weighing heavily on their minds. The flaws that the, the flaws they see may not even really exist, but they believe they do and that's enough for them. They don't like themselves very much, but their ego still force them to hold themselves in the highest regard. And point number eight, they believe those who are happy must be ignored, yet are still convinced they can't be as happy themselves. 
miserable people would do much better trying to figure out how it is that happy people can be as happy as they are instead of telling them they shouldn't be happy. That is that if they are smarter, more intelligent, they would be just as miserable with life as they are. Maybe these people know something that the miserable person don't. Being miserable is fixable, but only if you believe someone out there has a right, even if you yourself don't. Let me read that again. Maybe these people know something that the miserable person don't. Being miserable is fixable. Let me repeat that again. Being miserable is fixable, but only if you believe someone out there has it right, even if you yourself don't. So what is joy and where does it come from? Okay. Well, what I wanna do is I wanna study a scripture with you. Um, and as you know, we're doing an SOS uh, study when we go here. And uh, we are studying the main scripture uh, for uh, God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. So in this session, uh, um, what we're going to do is we're going to look at the, the first four words of the scripture again. For God is, for God so loved, okay? What I want you to do right now uh, in the observation of the words, what is your observation about bearing joy by just using these four words? For God so loved. But let's change it. For God does love. Okay, we know what's coming after this, right? God loves the world. So let's look at that again. For God does love. Okay. Statement of action. What statement of action can you think of that these words would signify the joy God wants us to have? That's very important when we think about that, right? So in preparation for our video, the teaching that teaches us about joy, please do the SOS study first. Okay, so uh, I have a self uh, reflection question here. Okay. Is it God's desire that you should have joy in our lives? Let me read that again. Is it God's desire that we should have joy in our lives? Okay, so I'm going to have you do an SOS study on your own in your book. Uh, you can, if you don't have this book and you want to um, get a notebook and write this scripture down. This scripture is uh, out of Genesis 1:26, and it says, Then God said, Let us make uh, mankind in our image, in our likeness, so that they may rule over the fish of the sea and the birds of the sky, over the livestock and all the wild animals and over all the creatures that move along the ground. Okay, what I want you to do is I want you to write down an observation of the words and then I want you to make a statement of action, okay? And uh, what I would like you to do, uh, my friends, is write it down in the comments if you'd like or share it with somebody. So what we're gonna do at this time, my friends, let's watch the compatible for joy clip I filmed a few years uh, back and let's learn about the qualities of Jesus and uh, as you see uh, I'm going to put up a, uh, a picture on the screen that's going to start this out and it's going to say are we compatible so before that starts my friends I want you to take a little break I want you to think about your compatibility with Jesus Christ and as uh, soon as uh, that video comes on I'll come back and I'll ask you some questions about uh, hopefully what you observed uh, in, in that video. Remember, we're doing an observation and a statement of action. I help you with the observation questions that are based around that scripture. So I'll see you back in just a little bit. I'm here today to uh, continue my study with you on uh, on on who God is and uh, in order to have a, a relationship with him we need to understand that so what does John 316 have to do with compatible and joy that's a question that I uh, left with you uh, yesterday or the day before to get you to understand and to start thinking about uh, how compatibility and joy relates to that scripture so uh, to recap on what we talked about before, we realized that God uh, so loved the world. Okay, that's, that's the first phrase in John 3.16. 
We learned in the last teaching video the lesson that God's love shows he was a compatible God and that is why he loves us. So he's compatible with us. Uh, and uh, so how does he love us? Um, I think he seeks our highest good and uh, that's, that's pretty evident in, in giving us uh, Jesus Christ, okay? Um, so, you know, he loves us by seeking our highest good. Okay, so what is our highest good? That we should have joy in our life. Okay, how does God bring us joy? That's where we're at. Okay, God brings us joy by being compatible with us. Okay, it says in Genesis 1 verse 26, and it tells me that God is compatible with us because it says that let us make man in our image. So that basically tells me that uh, we are created compatible with God because we're created in his image. That's, that's very encouraging, but that's, that's a key point in knowing why God loves us, okay? So what does joy actually bring us with God, okay? Why, why does God have joy in us? So as I was saying, what does joy have to do with God loving us? Well, you got to look at uh, the, the outward action, the character trait of joy. Okay, that's glad it's not based on circumstances. I, I think when God looks at, at our life and he, back in the time that he sent Jesus Christ into our life, uh, the world was pretty chaotic. Okay, um, Noah was uh, called to build an ark, okay, because the, the, the population was just out of control, right? And so uh, God just thought, well, I'll just start all over. I will, I will destroy the world, okay? But I'm going to save all the animals, okay, all the creatures, it says. They came in pairs and uh, sometimes they have to come in sets. But... God also saved seven people. So in all actuality, you know, we're, we're the offspring of Adam, but we're all grandfathered into Noah as well, okay? Because everything it says, everything was destroyed through the flood, right? So God promises that he would not do that again, okay? And that's, that's why the rainbow is created. Uh, so, so we know that we're going to figure out how to bring God joy, okay? So joy in the action part of it is gladness not based on the circumstances in our life. So when you reach out to joy through, through the fruit of the Spirit, you got to understand that it's gladness not based on your circumstances. So God finds joy in us regardless of the environment in our life, the actions in our life. He wants to find joy in us because after all, he's compatible with us. So that's why he created us. He created us for joy for him. So in order to sum up uh, this, this life lesson here um, on, on joy and compatible, um, we know that we're compatible with God because he created us and he created us because he wanted to have joy with us. Regardless of our circumstances, if, if, if we're walking with Jesus Christ, God's going to find joy with us. That's, that, that's the bottom line. Okay, so in knowing God, we know that he is, com he is a committed and a loving God and he loves us because that's his, that's his description, that's his fruit. Second, we know that we are compatible with God, okay? Third, we know that God wants to use us to have joy, which is gladness that is not based on circumstances in our own life. So when you're dealing with the trials and the tribulations in your life, can you find joy through that? Can you find some gladness that is not based on the circumstances in your life? Okay, and that's, that's, that's highly important, okay, to find that joy. Because if we go through this life without joy, that's gonna lead us to bitterness and we're not gonna seek the highest good of other people. So, so for God so love the world, okay, that's where we're at, for God so love the world. Thank you for uh, watching. Well, my friends, uh, 
noticed uh, in that video again I had a, a beard getting started there and what I want you to know in, in that in those videos is I want you to start looking at the background uh, in the next video on uh, peace there's gonna be a cross that's gonna have a light on there and as you watch these teaching sessions I'm always gonna put that video in the middle of the session I want you to focus on the light on that cross. It has significant meaning to me, and that's why I didn't just reshoot those uh, videos uh, in current time as I appear now. I think it's important that you see that. So, uh, my friends, uh, let me put up another slide on here, and let's uh, ask some uh, personal reflection questions from the video um, that we uh, call that we watched called "Compatible for Joy." So my number one question, and I'm just going to read these questions and I'm not going to really get into them. I just want to read them to you so you, so you have a vast knowledge of what I'm doing here. Okay. Number one, why does God find joy in me? Number two, does the phrase gladness not based on your circumstances help me to put joy into action? I want you to ask these questions specifically for yourself. Okay. Number three, is God... A committed and loving God. Number four, am I compatible with God? Number five, do I think that God wants to use me to bring joy to other people? Number six, and here comes the train, my friends, my apologies. Number six, the scripture I study says, let us create man in our image. So does that mean I am also created in his image? Number seven, is God worthy of honor and worthy to be adored? Number eight, am I worthy to be honored and adored because I am created in his image? And number nine, am I compatible with God? Number 10, what does it mean to be compatible with God? To answer this question, let's once again go to our relationship book for the teaching on compatibility. So my friends, I'm gonna pause until that train passes and I'll be back in just a little bit. My friends, uh, sorry for that interruption, but I didn't want to have the train whistle blowing through my, uh, my teaching here. As I pause there, uh, what I was thinking about is sometimes we can feel miserable because we're sick, because we're not feeling good, because we might have a broken bone, we might have uh, a toothache, we might have a headache, we might have an eye ache. That kind of misery is different than what I'm talking about in this teaching, okay? You could be miserable, feeling physically miserable and still have joy. So we need to see if we're compatible with Jesus here in order to bear his fruit. So what I'd like to do is I'd like to put up a, a slide on the screen here that says foundational quality number two, compatible. Okay, so we're looking at Jesus' uh, qualities right now. We're, we're, we're looking at the fact, are we compatible with Jesus? And you can see two cherries there. And if you look, there's a, a, a heart that's connecting those cherries. Well, those cherries are also hearts, right? So let me, look, let me put it on the next slide here. And let's actually get into what uh, compatible means, okay? Compatibility isn't necessarily having about having identical personalities. As difficulties can complicate each other, complement each other. Let me read that again. Compatible. Compatibility isn't necessarily about having identical personalities, as differences can com complement each other. It is more about the importance of establishing the essentials. First off, let us identify with the scripture that makes us compatible with God. And that's the one that I asked you to do an SOS study on when I left the last uh, um, session here before we went to the compatible uh, um, area. So uh, Genesis 1, 26 in part A, then God said, let us make man in our image, in our likeness. What does it mean to be made in the likeness of God? Okay, that's a valid question, right? Man was made last of all the cr cr creatures. This was both an honor and a favor to man. Yet man was made the same day that the beasts were. His body was made of the same earth as theirs. And while he is in this body, he inhabits the same earth with them. 
God forbid that by indulging the body and the desires of it, we should make ourselves like the beast. Uh, we should, okay? God forbid that by indulging the body and the desires of it, we should make ourselves like the beasts that perish. Man was to be a creature different from all that had been made here on earth. Flesh and spirit, heaven and earth, must be put together in him. God said, let us make man. Man, when he was made, was to glorify the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Unto that great name we are baptized for to to do that great for to that great name we owe our being it is the soul of man that especially bears god's image man was made upright in ecclesiastes 7 verse 29 he understand his understanding saw divine things clearly and truly there were no errors or mistakes in his knowledge he will his will consented at once and in all things through the will of God. His affect affections were all regular, and he had no bad appetites or passions. His thoughts were easily brought and fixed to the best subject, thus holy, thus happy. That's the state of Adam when God first created him to walk in on the earth. Holy, thus happy. Okay, let's put up another slide on the screen here that talks about self-reflection questions. Number one, initially, do I think I share similar core values with God? Okay. Number two, what are my values? <clears throat> In discovering God as a potential mate, a common thread should be your spiritual belief system. The Bible states, be ye not equally yoked with non-believers. And we see that in 2 Corinthians 6.14. Keep in mind that God's desire or God's design would only promote unity and oneness with Him. Okay? Number uh, question number three. Do I have similar life similar lifestyles as those of unbelievers? That's a valid question. Do I have similar lifestyles as those of unbelievers? Okay, we're talking about believers right now. If I'm a believer, do I have a similar lifestyle as an, uh, an unbeliever? Number four, what type of lifestyle do I live in? <clears throat> Pardon me, my voice is kind of creating problems. Studies show that uh, people from similar backgrounds are more likely to stay together. This is not always the case, but it serves as a launching pad for ju judgment. And question number five, considering my friends and family, is there a common balance with them in this area of compatibility with God? Okay. Number six, is my own life in balance with God? Is my own life in balance with God? Let's look at another slide. If you observe in balance with others and your uh, core values are challenged, it would be best if you uh, reevaluate their relationship with you to prevent any misleading expectations. Look at your own lifestyle and see if it is in balance with God first. And so here, let's do another SOS uh, study, please. This scripture is found in 2 Corinthians 6, 14. Do not be yoked together with not unbelievers. For what do, does righteousness and wickedness have in common? Or what fellowship can light have with darkness? So there's a warning against idolatry here, worship of idols. So uh, find me some observation words there and then give me a statement of action, if you would, please. Let's move on to the next slide. What does com compatible mean to me exactly? What does compatible mean to me exactly? There are five major components in a compatible relationship. These components are spiritual, social, mental, physical, and emotional. Now we look at our relationships with other people, right? So I put the first most important one because that's what I am. I'm a, I'm a spiritual uh, health consultant. So let's, let's look at spiritual compatibility. Being spiritual has different levels of importance to different people. If you are a deeply spiritual person with very strong opinions, with strong beliefs about holidays, prayers, and baptism, 
it's likely you are going to be more compatible with another person of equal, strong, or similar beliefs. <coughs> <coughs> Sorry about that, my friends. I'm just trying to keep going here. Um, um, I have been uh, suffering from a cold and not feeling good myself. That doesn't mean uh, I'm miserable. It just means I'm not feeling good. So uh, for a Christian, the most important of these is, is spiritual compatibility. Since marriage is a spiritual relationship, your spiritual compatibility will influence the quality of your relationship more than any other factor. There are two types to consider here. Number one, are we both Christians? In 2 Corinthians 6, 14-15, Paul writes, Do not be bound together with unbelievers, for what partnership has righteousness and lawless, lawlessness, or what fellowship has light with darkness? Or what harmony has Christ with Satan, or what has a believer in common with an unbeliever? Okay. Let's go on to the next slide, and uh, let, let's continue here. This passion, pass passage warns that a Christian should not enter a partnership with an unbeliever because it will be a relationship built on opposing values and goals. Building relationships on Christian values, trust, and love are essential in a Christian's life, especially in the most intimate of all relationships, marriage. God created marriage as a reflection of Christ and the church, and its greatest fulfillment and enjoyment can only be found when both husband and wife are grow, have a growing relationship with Him. When Christians marry non-believers, they usually experience a growing frustration after marriage. And here are some points that you may experience if you are married to a non-believer as a believer. They are un able to discuss the most precious intimate part of their lives with their partners. Point number two, they have conflicting goals and expectations. Point number three, they clash over the values they teach their children. Point number four, they have differing, differenting, different circles of friends. And uh, point number five, they have difficulty communicating and resolving conflict. Okay, let's put up another slide. Let's, let's talk about this in a little bit more depth. If you are considering marriage and one of, of you has received Christ as Lord and Savior, but the other one has not, we strongly recommend that you either put your relationship on hold or end it altogether. If your future spouse is unwilling to repent and change now, don't expect it to happen after you marry. Remember, my friends, the number one reason we as Christians follow Jesus Christ is so we can repent. So we do have somebody to repent to and a place to start anew. Okay? Also, we become like who we spend time with. Uh, uh, Jim Rohn had said, and I'm quoting him, you are the average of the five people you spend uh, the most time with. It may be subtle, but if you are spending, but if I am spending my time and energy with a non-believer, I will invariably begin thinking and believing like they do to some extent, which will cause me to even quietly doubt absolute truth that can be very dangerous. And, and second, if neither of you have received Christ, we recommend that you put off any marriage plans so you can focus on learning more about a relationship with Him. This is because without a relationship with Jesus Christ, you will have a hard time understanding the marriage relationship to the fullest capacity in which it was intended. Give yourself time to talk to Christian friends, to your pastor or a spiritual relationship coach, and come to a solid decision where you stand with uh, God. My friends, before I go on and read point number two, what I am is a spiritual guide. My, my specialty is heart refinement, but I offer spiritual health consulting services. So this is talking about marriage and, and waiting to make sure that you talk to somebody as a couple about your spiritual beliefs. It's important. It's important that we, go, that we do that. Okay, let's look at uh, number two uh, about why uh, um, we shouldn't marry a non-believer. Do we both share the same commitment to spiritual growth and to serve God? That's a big question, right? <clears throat> Many question, Christians know they should not marry a non-believer. Unfortunately, they go no further in evaluating their spiritual compatibility. My friends, one of the things that uh, I believe that you're going to be able to achieve and benefit from taking this online course, we have a, 
um, a total of eight uh, module stages in this uh, heart to heart refinement school. If you and somebody that you're dating goes all the way through these module stages together and, and you're looking towards a, a relationship with God right in the middle of it, this is going to help you, guide you on the path that you need. Okay. So uh, as I take a drink, let's put up another slide on the screen. It says 1 John 2 verse 15 tells us, <clears throat> Do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. You may both have received Christ, but if you... But if one of you is more focused on loving the world rather than the loving God, you will experience many of the same conflicts as a believer and a non-believer. Your goals and values will differ. Your lives will, will uh, head in different directions. If you are both growing in Christ, you will experience a special joy and teamwork in your marriage. Remember the word special joy. That's what we're talking about, right? Is to bear that joy. Okay? Running coaches usually encourage their long-distance runners to train in groups rather than as individuals. In groups, runners encourage and push each other to ignore their weaknesses and pain. In fact, a runner may run faster in a group rather than he would by himself, yet feels less fatigued. In the same way, two people who share the same commitment to God can encourage and help each other, keeping their eyes on Christ as they run with endurance. To evaluate this area of your, of your spiritual compatibility, begin by asking yourself these discussion questions. Again, my friends, I'm just going to read the questions. I'm not going to teach too much on them. Uh, my teaching uh, needs to be done on the uh, content of, of the book itself. Okay, And as you know, I am reading from a book, and the slide is on the screen, and uh, I urge you to purchase the book and follow along. Okay, Question number one, do uh, we believe, do we both share the same desire to know and please God. Number two, do I have any sense that one of us is putting on a facade of spiritual commitment? Number three, do our actions back up our words? Number four, do we both consistently display a desire to obey God in all things? Number five, what priorities do each of us place on loving other people when it does not fit our primary objective? Number six, are we both willing to follow God's direction? Okay, now let's uh, look at social compatibility. We looked at spiritual, now we need to look at social compatibility. Remember the five areas that we're looking at. Let's get into social. Social, it's made up of all our experiences, both with our families and our upbringing. Intensely, social people often uh, need only social individuals. Intensely, social people often need other social individuals. The outgoing often seek out like-minded of the opposite sex, but it's more than just being alike personality-wise. It's about seeking similar things in your per personal lives. If you both value family, it is a good indication of a strong component to your overall com compatibility. Your social interaction pattern will assess whether you seek out togetherness or prefer solitude, whether you prefer to be in the background or foreground of social interaction. Why is social compatibility so important to have joy with somebody, my friends? That's, that, that's a very good question, right? So are you more com most compatible around other people or do you prefer to be alone? Okay. Researchers uh, have found a strong and positive correlation between satisfaction with a uh, couple's social life and self-reporting relationship satisfaction. Whether you fall in the most outgoing social category, the most uh, internal oriented category, or somewhere in between has a large influence on your relationships and overall lifestyle. Differences in this area can be great, causing clashes between couples about how much time to spend on their own together or socially. Disagreements about how often and with whom their partner should and should not socialize can lead to reoccurring conflicts, jealousy, resentment, pent-up frustration, feelings of abandonment, rejection, 
and injustice. So my friends, it's very, very important that you have a sense of social compatibility. You need to understand what the social compatibility is so you can maintain the joy that God wants you to bear, okay? Let's look at uh, the number third area, which is uh, mental comp uh, compatibility. Learning the qualities that make a person an ideal partner might not be what you expected. While the reasons we fall in love are often a mystery, the reasons we stay in love are far less elusive. They may, there may be no such thing as the perfect partner, but an ideal partner can be found in someone who has developed themselves in ways beyond looks, charms, and success. Although we each uh, seek out a specific set of qualities that are uniquely meaningful to us, there are certain psychological characteristics both you and your partner can strive for. That will make the relationship m much more likely for lasting success. Okay, now uh, it says group discussion questions. And what I'd like you to do if you're in a relationship or you're studying this with a group of people, I want you to talk to your people about this. So well, number one, what are the qualities of the mental nature I should look for? What are the qualities of the mental nature I should look for? Number two, what do I think are the deal breakers of a relationship if the mental arena is destroyed? Number three, what does my mental ability look like? Okay, and note, being a college graduate is not what I am seeking in an answer here. Okay, let's look up uh, what does mental ability look like. Say number one, an ideal partner has grown up. One common criticism people make about their partners is that they need to grow up. What many of us fail to realize is that growing up is not merely a matter of acting like an adult. To truly grow up means recognizing and allowing God to resolve early childhood traumas or losses and understand how these events influence our current behavior. Therefore, the ideal partner is willing to reflect on their past they possess a maturity that comes from being emotionally emancipated from their family of origin. They have developed a strong sense of independence and an annuity, have made the psychological shift from boy to man or girl to woman. Having broken ties to old identities and patterns, this person is more available to their partner and the new family they have created. Okay. <clears throat> Because this partner has grown up in Christ, they are less likely to reenact childhood experiences in an intimate relationship because they have evolved as a person. They aren't looking for someone to compensate for shortcomings and weaknesses. They aren't looking for someone to compete to complete their incompleteness. Rather, this person has is looking for someone like themselves. They are looking for another adult with qualities like their own with whom they can share life with. Okay, let's put up uh, number two as we talk about this. Uh, an ideal partner is open and non-defensive, okay? We're talking about mental compatibility now. The ideal partner is open and not easily defended and is willing to be vulnerable. As a result, they are approachable and receptive to feedback without being overly sensitive about any topic. Their openness also enables them to be forthright in expressing feelings, thoughts, dreams, and desires. It includes an interest in personal and sexual development. We do not promote sex before marriage, but only within the confinements of a healthy marriage, okay? We are going to talk about a lot of things in this online school, my friends. It's important, okay? Let's look at number three in the area of uh, mental compatibility. An ideal partner is honest and lives with integrity. The ideal partner realizes the importance of honesty in a close relationship. Honesty builds trust between people. Dishonesty confuses the other person, destroying their trust along with their sense of Reality, nothing has a more destructive impact on a close relationship between two people than dishonesty and deception. Even in such painful situations as infidelity, the blatant deception involved is often more hurtful than the unfaithful act itself. The ideal 
partner strives to live a life of integrity so that there are no discrepancies between one's word and actions. This goes for all levels of communication, both verbal and nonverbal. Let's look at uh, number four of uh, mental compatibility. An ideal partner has empathy for and understanding for their partner. The ideal partner perceives their mate on an intellectual observational level and an emotional intuitive level. This partner can both understand and emphasize with their partner. When a couple understands each other, they become aware of the commonalities that ex exist between them and recognize and appreciate the differences. When both partners are empathetic, this is com com capable of communicating with respect for the other person's wants, attitudes, and values. Each person feels understood and validated. <clears throat> Having a little bit of a, a cold really uh, affects my speaking as you can tell so um, I'm sorry about that just kind of um, bear with me here. Number five an ideal partner is physically loving. An ideal partner is responsive in many levels, acknowledging and demonstrating feelings of warmth and tenderness, not to deny each other the affection they desire. Together they discuss openly what is acceptable to the other person. Number six, an ideal partner has a sense of humor. The ideal partner has a sense of humor. A sense of humor can be a life savior in a relationship. The ability to laugh at oneself and at life's policies helps us maintain a proper perspective when dealing with sensitive issues that may arise. Couples who are playful and uh, teasing often diffuse potential volatile situations with their humor. A good sense of humor eases the tense, tense moments of the relationship. Okay, now the next area of uh, compatibility that we need to look at is physical compatibility, my friends. What does uh, physical compatibility look at look like? Uh, here's the slide on the screen here. How important is physical compatibility in a relationship? Based on the content of this compatible compatibility level and in the arena of which it is being taught, it is not my desire to lead into a sexual realm of compatibility. In a Christian's life, they must practice sexual purity until they are married. With that said, I will address another area of physical compatibility that I think is often overlooked. The area I am speaking about is in health and fitness. I have found in my research with many people who value this aspect in life are attracted to partners who also do. They often engage in common activities of fitness which make the relationship smooth in this area. They may like to hike, bike, and swim, lift weights in, or go to a gym together. They may e even engage in other in their activities with other people. If they are maintaining their overall health and fitness, they are generally, they also generally agree on their nutritional choices. If this is an area that is not important to either person, there is no issue here. What cha challenges and potentially strains a relationship is when one person values this and the other does not. I notice this more with older couples where one partner was perhaps more overweight and in poor health and the other partner may then become worried about their partner's uh, health and mortality. I, I understand that. I understand that. The bottom line, as you can see on this next screen here, the bottom line is that different uh, things work for different uh, couples. While some uh, highly value aspects of this physical arena and want their partner to value it too, some couples can enjoy the aspect of their physical health that uh, are important to them while allowing their partner to do what's important for them. And there are yet other couples who do not value this area at all. The couples who report being happy and satisfied with their relationship do not have conflict in this area. Either they are compatible in this area or they simply allow each other to fully express themselves in this area as they see fit. Before I go on to emotional compatibility, I do want to make a point that, uh, you know, my wife and I, we uh, go for walks together, we ride our bikes together, 
And uh, when I was uh, remodeling a bathroom renovation that you've seen in the uh, Reasons Why We Follow uh, Christ a video, uh, that gentleman was married to almost over 50 years to his wife and I asked him what was the most important thing uh, in the relationship and he basically told me it was to stay healthy for your partner. That's the most important thing. But not just physically healthy but spiritually, emotionally and socially. So now my friends let's talk about emotional compatibility. This falls into our spiritual and emotional fields. This is the biggest reason why I created this school in the first place. Number one. Do I make the other person feel desirable emotions for me? Number two, do I make the other person feel good, understood, proud, happy, and loved? Or do I make the other person feel awkward, misunderstood, unhappy, and uncomfortable? In creating this book, I asked the women I interviewed what was the most important to them as to what they needed in a relationship. The most common answer I received was emotional stability. What does that look like? Just as uh, everyone has a unique set of fingerprints, all people experience life differently. Life experiences, personalities, physical differences, perspectives, values, and goals vary to some extent from person to person. Consequently, each relationship has its own dynamics and degree of intimacy. You may connect well on a sexual level with your spouse and intellectually with your best friend. For instance, another level of compatibility refers to how well you and your relationship partner respond to one another emotionally. Okay, Let me put up another slide on the screen here. Emotional needs. Although emotional needs vary, men, many share similar foundations. People have uh, innate desires for affection such as hugs, kisses, words of affirmation as well as for honest and open communication such as talking about feelings, daily events, goals and plans for the future. They may also be the need for what the relationship requires called recreational companionship. This is the participation of one's favorite activities. For couples raising children, they may be the need for sharing participation in parenting and discipline. Overall, this comes from love and commun compassion from the core of our emotional needs, okay? So now my next question is, is uh, what is an emotional connection? What is an emotional connection? People in the process of cultivating a relationship often feel more connected with one another as they learn more about each other and share experiences. They learn to appreciate qualities, talents, opinions, and motivations in each other. They need not have an overabundance of commonalities or the same emotional need to nurture a relationship. Instead, each should understand the emotional need of their partner. They are not required to meet every need. And awareness or uh, respect for them is the primary need for any emotional, authentic relationship. Okay, and let's look at assessing compatibility now. Just as relationships and individuals vary, compatibility is subject. Because compatibility is based on the dynamics of, of each relationship. For instance, a wife may find that her husband inadequately fulfills many of her needs. Although he may be lacking, uh, let me read that again. For instance, a wife may find that her husband adequately fulfills many of her uh, needs. Although he may be lacking in some area of emotional sensitivity. If she is unable or unwilling to get these needs met, elsewhere and her husband is unable let me read that again if she is unable or unwilling to get these needs met elsewhere and her husband is unavailable or unwilling to adjust to her need it is likely that they have an unhappy unhappy relationship if she finds however that she has satisfactorily has satisfactory emotional relationships with her friends or family, she may be comfortable in her marriage. They do not need to meet all of each other's needs to be compatible, just to find a balance that works. Okay? My friends, I, I read a lot, okay? And uh, sometimes it overwhelms my mind and sometimes it just floods in. Sometimes I need to go slow. Sometimes I need to take the time to read. I know that these uh, teaching sessions get into an hour, over an hour long, but my friends, if you were going to take a class at a school 
your lecture could be almost 90 minutes long and you're gonna to have to take notes. You're gonna to have to write in your book, okay? This is important. It's probably more important than any other educational program that you can take, okay? Let's look at uh, some uh, examples. What are some of your emotional needs in a relationship? Share with your spiritual guide. Examples are kind, consistent, and honest communication, the willingness to work through difficulties and disagreements, a sense of humor, some fun, and a bit of distraction from the vigorous of daily lives, sharing life lessons with the one you love, emotional support, validation, and compliments, love, intimacy, romance, and desire, sharing goals and dreams that resonate with you both, compassion, acceptance, and forgiveness, a mutual desire to step out of the box, being able to admit mistakes and talking about them, and as we put another slide on the screen here, my friends, just as we uh, must breathe to survive, your love needs to breathe a breath of fresh air to flourish. Give your relationship and yourself what it needs to thrive as a truly loving gesture. When it comes to being compatible to have joy and not be miserable, it takes a certain quality to make that work. What do I mean by that? Have you ever had much joy in a relationship, job, education, church, environment or hobby you were involved with that did not bring you any joy? I'm going to ask that question again, my friends. What do I mean by that? Have you ever had much joy in a relationship, job, education, church environment or hobby where you were involved with that did not bring you any joy? Get this, my friends. What happens when you are not compatible with someone, your morals and beliefs are too different. Difference is good. We want to be exposed to new things and new ways to live in this world. Unless he or she is racist or we want you to conform to a faith that you don't believe in, sometimes people choose not to change. Okay, what about a job? How many of you know if you are compatible with the job that you have? Life is simpler than we make it. You probably don't need an assessment to tell you if you are good at your job. If you are honest with yourself at all, you should uh, know it is time to move on. But many of us are unwilling to say it out loud, especially if speaking the truth might fo force us to spend time and effort changing big parts of our lives. The truth is compatible. Compatibility does not hinge on some personal inventory of traits. Compatibility isn't something you have. It's something you make. It's progress. One that you negotiate as you go along again and again. It's disposition and attitude, a willingness to work. Okay, let's go on to another side here. People might agonize and think, do we have the same likes and dislikes? But people are not aware of how powerful self-fulfilling prophecies are. They have expectations in a relationship, whether that is one of romance, work, or education, and we tend to make them come true. The most satisfied people are those who, with overly rosy views of each other. But the plain truth is, your joy is being threatened, then are you compatible? Let me read that again. But the plain truth is, if your joy is being threatened, then are you compatible? Okay? It is, a com it is common today to hear believers speak of a difference between joy and happiness. The teaching usually makes the following points. Number one, happiness is feeling, but joy is not. Happiness is fleeting, but joy is everlasting. Happiness depends on circumstances of people, but joy is a gift from God. Number four, happiness is worldly, but joy is divine. But there is no such distinction made in Scripture, and focus is a distinction between two words that are so obviously close in meaning is unnecessary. Let me read that again. But there is no such distinction made in Scripture, and forces a distinction between two words that are so obviously close in meaning is unnecessary. If a person is joyful, then he or she is happy. There is no such thing as gloom joy. We cannot drain joy of emotion and still call it joy. When God's Spirit gives us joy, then we are happy people. Christians should be joyful, and happiness should be 
characterizing our everyday lives. But if these things around us do not bring us joy, we must question this compatibility to ourselves. What I like to do, my friends, is I like to take a little pause and I'm going to come back and I'm going to talk about the character trait of joy. And uh, take a little break, uh, pause your video, because you know the video is just kind of running concession. So take a little break, and then when, when we come back, we're going to talk about the quality character trait of joy. Well, my friends, I just got a couple of pages left to go, and uh, we're going to talk about uh, joy as a character trait that we should... Uh, um, have in order to bear joy against the misery in our life. So as you can tell uh, into the pre-area of, of this uh, little session here, uh, you've seen uh, joy with a person just jumping really high uh, on the screen there. So on this slide right here, my friends, it says, what is joy and where does it come from? Okay, so we understood what uh, misery was, we, we read through that, and then we understood what the quality of joy was, is which be, is being compatible. So now we gotta really dig in here and look at what joy is. So Webster's Dictionary defines joy as feelings of great happiness or pleasure, especially of an ele elevated or spiritual kind. Spiritual kind, right? Something that brings happiness, a pleasurable aspect, or something of a source of happiness. Joy is a gift from God. Joy is found in God, for He is a source of pleasure, delight, wonder, and charm. How amazing are those words, my friend? Let me read that again. Joy is a gift from God. Joy is found in God, for He is a source of pleasure, delight, wonder, and charm. That's an amazing saying. Again, it should be known that learning to bear the fruit of the Spirit is about transforming your mind and the way you perceive life as you have been living it. As you, you read the following pages with me, you will understand that the transition will change your life if you reflect on the key actions of the words of each fruit. To understand joy, you need to understand the action of joy from a spiritual sense because it is done from a spirit of faith. To understand faith, you need to understand the the opposite of faith is doubt. So the spirit of doubt leads us to the opposite of what true joy is, which is misery. The attitude of being miserable is being unhappy. And when you realize the action of true joy is gladness that is not based on your circumstances around you, you will begin to search for that happiness that is only found in Jesus Christ. And as I put my next slide up on the screen here, my friends, uh, like love, joy is being confident in your faith. It is not just what you know, but who you know. If Christ is your joy, then your love for Jesus is the picture other people need to see in your life, so they can better know Him through your example. When you know you have the good news, you will know Jesus, not just as Savior, but as Lord, who gives perspective and gives you the confidence and the patience to endure anything. This realization impacts and should fuel you to endure the toughest of times and to proclaim Jesus to others. If you are confident in His power and impact in your life, if your love in Him it will show Christ to others through you, you need to realize that you have no control over what happens to you at times, whether it is in trials, suffering, setbacks, injuries, sickness, or even death of loved ones. Remember when my friends, when I started this out, I talked about the sickness. I, I talked about injury. I talked about even death of loved ones. Okay, my friends, you can have joy in spite of all of that because joy is knowing Jesus Christ. You only have control over your uh, attitude and response. You are called to choose and declare your situation as joy. You can't change your circumstances. However, you can accept them by learning and growing from them. It does not, it does you no good to complain, to fret, or be angry or bitter. As these things you do or anyone around you any good. These things do, you do not do you any good or anyone around you. All that complaining just makes the situation seem worse and blinds you to your ability to be better and not bitter. Real Christian maturity will grow because of your problems. 
They will strengthen you and make you better, stronger, and able to get over things faster and get on with your life. When you can learn to do that, then you can become better used to God and to others in your life. Remember, joy is not happiness because you may not be content and pleased with your situation. Rather, joy is hope, and it is your hope. It is not a simple wish, rather the unshakable confidence of your future in Christ. Your pleasure comes from knowing He is in charge and cares about you. So you can look at whatever situation you face and say, This is good, this is better for me, or this will help me. You may not understand it, but you can truly trust God. And now, my friends, my last slide in this um, session study. He will be there, and He will carry you through it. You are called to declare your situation, whatever that may be, as joy. Because it is not a question of if you will have problems, but when. All God's children face problems. They are inevitable, unavoidable, and unpredictable, and no one is immune. How you deal with them is an issue for your contentment and faith. In closing, my friends, please reflect on the following questions. Am I compatible with those things around me that affect my joy? Am I happy and experiencing joy because of it? If not, what can my life group do to help me so that I may feel joy? We're going to talk about life groups here in a minute, my friends. Pray and ask God for joy so that you may have gladness that is not based on your circumstances. And my friends, as that slide leads to the screen, I'm going to come and talk to you for a minute. I'm going to talk to you about life groups. Life groups is an amazing thing to get involved in a life group, my friends. If you can get into involved in a life group, that would be an amazing thing for you. If you don't belong in a church, well, get involved with one. And what I would suggest that you do is these online courses that you take. If you are watching this online course and you'd like to start a life group, you can take this online course and plug it into your laptop. Take your laptop through your HDMI cable and plug it into a big screen TV and invite a group of people to come uh, to your house or to a classroom at the church or wherever you're meeting at and ask them to to go through these studies with you. Buy a book for them, you host the life group, you use my online courses as uh, your life group leadership, and uh, I try to keep my courses to an hour, you know, uh, um, because I cover a lot of stuff in these, these courses. And you can pause it and you can um, discuss certain things with that life group. If uh, you have a problem starting a life group or you don't know anybody, go up and talk to your church pastor. Say, hey, I'd like to start a life group and uh, you can use this program. You can order as many of these books as you want and you just have one video in front of you and uh, I will be your instructor, I will be your guide and you just stop the video whenever there's discussion group questions. This is powerful because when you study this with a group of people, you're guiding each other. You're operating on your spiritual motivational gifts together. And we're going to talk about our motivational gifts in uh, um, module four, which is stage four, before we get into the second part of the fruit of the spirit. That's important, my friends. It's very important that you understand that. So my friends, the next session that we're going to talk about is we're going to talk about peace. Okay, we're going to talk about the opposing nature of peace, which is worry. But in order to have peace, we have to be trustworthy. we got to trust God to take care of us. So that's coming up in uh, the next session. Until then, my friends, may God bless you. May his face shine upon you. And may Jesus always bring you joy. I'll see you later.